Welcome to the New Church Podcast. You know, I have like two basic settings for conversation. Meaningless nonsense and probably a little too deep for the other person. And both of those settings could probably be described as straight to awkward. <laughs> like you might, you might walk up to me and say, how you doing? And then I'd say, well, if I get to grade myself, I'm going to say I'm amazing. Or Angel might walk into my office and say, hey, mom said you wanted to ask me something. And then I'd like search my mind for the most absurd question that I could possibly ask him. Last night, it was, yeah, I was wondering how many kneecaps you were planning on using on Christmas. But he's used to it. Last night, he just said, two? <laughs> but he's just as likely to say, your father was a kneecap. <laughs> or I might be in line at the grocery store and start talking just a little bit too loud to Kim, saying something like, okay, so did you get the ingredients for the peanut buttered mustard cakes? Because we need boiled peanuts, mustard sauce, chocolate syrup, pickle juice, brown sugar, mayonnaise, chiclets, <laughs> and I'll just keep going until somebody turns around and looks to see what kind of crazy person makes chocolate mustard cakes. And sometimes, sometimes people say they can't tell the difference between when I'm kidding and when I'm not. But I think it's easy. You just have to ask yourself this question. Was what I said funny? Kim says that's not going to work. Something about how not everyone gets my humor. Whatever. Won't stop me from trying. <laughs> so, I'm usually kidding. Unless I'm not. And when I'm not, I'm usually too serious. And there's not very much in the middle. You ask me how it's going, and if I don't say something completely ridiculous, then I might, without any warning just jump into an existential crisis of how life is meaningless and completely hopeless without faith. I guess I'm just not good at small talk. Which brings us to this week's edition of the Gospel According to Xmas. Today, we're looking at the movie Elf, which is as silly as it gets. But it's also got layers of deeper meaning. It's a story about an adopted elf named Buddy who was raised in the North Pole working in Santa's toy factory for 30 years. And then he finds out that he's really a human. So he goes to New York in search of his real father. And to get there, he hops on an iceberg. He walks through the seven layers of the candy cane forest past the sea of twirly, swirly gumdrops and miraculously emerges from the Lincoln Tunnel. And he finds his dad. He eats spaghetti with maple syrup. He works in a shiny mailroom with ex-convicts and eventually saves Christmas. Will Ferrell, he, he plays Buddy as a wide-eyed, very kind but mentally unbalanced man-child. We root for him, but we also cringe at his naive sincerity. There's a lot of different directions that I could go with this today. Different gospel themes that are actually really strong. There's the stranger in a strange land theme. Like how we, as Christians are in the world, but not of the world. We're called to be different, a peculiar people. How this world is not our home. People aren't going to understand us. 
It's also a great picture of adoption, how we are the beloved children of God, adopted and loved unconditionally. It's a great picture of father hunger, how the gospel will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers. It's a story about faith because everything about Santa and his ability to bring Christmas to people all over the world is based on their ability to believe. Have Christmas spirit because it's Christmas spirit that powers the sleigh and allows the reindeer to fly. But see, in a world that has grown cynical, where belief and Christmas spirit are in short supply, almost gone, what's it going to take to help people believe again? And there's a great line in the movie when a young boy says to Santa, what we should do is get TV cameras, and you should go on television, and that way people will have to believe. But Santa says, no, that wouldn't work. Believing is not seeing. It's a pretty good reflection on what faith really is. I mean, it's a silly movie, but there's a lot going on if you look closely. I think the idea that pulls all these big ideas together is the most famous line from the movie. The best way to spread Christmas cheer is singing loud for all to hear. How it's our participation in the song that builds our faith and then at the same time spreads our faith to other people. Let's pray as we get started with this today. Father in heaven, we ask that you would take this time and that you would use it to build our faith, that you would use it to encourage us to be who you want us to be. Help us to believe and help us to live like believers. We pray in Christ's name, amen. All right, so there were these three rules that the elves lived by. Treat every day like Christmas, There's room for everyone on the nice list. And the best way to spread Christmas cheer is singing loud for all to hear. You know, those aren't bad rules for us either. We could do worse. Those were the rules for the elves who made the toys in Santa's workshop, which was actually a pretty high-pressure, stressful place to work. Buddy, since he was a mere human, he couldn't keep up with the magical elves. A typical elf could make a couple hundred toys a day, but Buddy could only manage about 85. Made him feel like a cotton-headed ninny-muggins, an outcast, a failure. But see, this is a story of transformation. He was a human but he was raised as an elf. Elves who eat nothing but sugar and sleep less than 40 minutes a night. In some ways, he couldn't keep up with them. But in other ways, he became a lot like them. At the end of the movie, with Christmas on the line, Santa looks at Buddy and he says, I need an elf's help. Buddy says, I'm not an elf. I can't do anything right. So Santa looks him right in the eyes and he says, Buddy, you're more of an elf than anyone I ever met. Which is another way this movie points us to the gospel. The way God both changes us slowly from the sinful, worldly creatures we used to be into the image of his son. And he also justifies us, validates us with his word, like immediately. The gospel is both of those things at the same time. It's immediate justification and slow sanctification. God's word, it tells us who we are in Christ 
and we're changed. Because of Jesus, your sins are forgiven. You are a beloved child of God. And as soon as you hear that, as soon as you believe that, it becomes reality, justification. And then the Holy Spirit works slowly in your life as you start doing the things that he tells you to do. Faith becomes faithfulness. Obedience becomes sanctification. And both of those things are the Holy Spirit working in you because of Jesus. So Buddy is a picture of that. He lived his life by the elf code. Treat every day like Christmas. There's room for everyone on the nice list. Best way to spread Christmas cheer, singing loud for all to hear. He lived with the elves. He worked with the elves. He ate elf food. And all those things slowly changed him more and more into the person that he wanted to be. But until Santa looked him in the eye and said he believed in him, he didn't really have peace. Maybe you need to hear that too. Not from Santa. But Jesus believes in you. Jesus believes in you. That's why he chose you. That's why he saved you by grace through faith. Jesus believes in you. He believes you can actually do what he saved you and called you to do. But you know, for us, it happens the other way around. Because first, Jesus says that you're forgiven and you're justified, that you're a beloved child of God. So first, you're justified, and then you're slowly sanctified into the Christian that he's called you to be. Like it says in Ephesians chapter 2, you were saved by grace through faith. So that you could do the good things that God prepared in advance for you to walk in. But you have to actually start walking. You got to actually do it. The life of faith, it doesn't just happen behind our eyes and between our ears. It's not just an intellectual exercise. We have to actually sing the song. Not just listen to it, not just hear it, not just learn it. It's not enough to say we have faith. We've got to actually be faithful too. It's pretty common at Christmas to hear people say something like, it's the thought that counts, right? It's the thought that counts. I don't know if there's a better text for Christmas than James chapter 2, 14 through 26. Because when we think of Christmas, don't we think of doing good for other people? Don't we think of being generous, helping the needy? Well, James says this. He says, what good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but you don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? Suppose you see a brother or sister who has no food or clothing. So you say, goodbye, have a good day, stay warm, eat well. But then you don't give that person any food or clothing. What good does that do? So you see, faith by itself It's not enough. Unless it produces good deeds, it's dead and useless. In other words, it's not the thought that counts. It's not just saying Merry Christmas that counts. You got to actually do something, give something for it to mean anything. Otherwise, it's like, hey, you know what? 
I thought about getting you that thing you really wanted, that thing you really need. I thought about getting you that for Christmas. I thought about it. I really did. I thought and I thought, but I didn't do it. I bought something for myself instead. It's the thought that counts? No. No, that's, that's why I think that's a really good Christmas verse. Because Jesus didn't just think about coming to earth and saving you. He actually did it. And it cost him everything. See, it's not the thought that counts. It really is the gift that matters. Believing something without doing anything about it is useless. So when Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments, this is what he's talking about. He's talking about actually doing what he says. Faith without doing something is nothing. It's not faith. It's faithlessness. So I think Christmas is actually a pretty good picture of Christian faith in action, at least the parts that are about generosity and love. There's an abundance of joy and well-wishing at Christmas, isn't there? Like Christmas cards. Christmas cards are awesome. Something we like to do around here at New Church is we like to pick up a stack of Christmas cards and then write little notes of love and encouragement in those cards And then pass them out to our friends here at church, just right here in church. A bunch of us have done this over the last few years. Please do that again this year. Get some cards. Think about the people in church that you appreciate. And just write them a little note. Hand them the card next Sunday or on Christmas Eve. Let's do that. Christmas is the perfect time to do something like that. When else are you going to do it? You know, the way Americans do Christmas is actually a wonderful picture of the gospel. The best parts of Christmas are tiny glimpses of the gospel in action. We think about the people we love. We try to come up with something special for them. We put a lot of thought into our gifts. And it's not just about our friends and our family. I mean, we tend to be more generous and more willing to help all kinds of people at Christmas time. It brings out the best in us. As long as we ignore the corporate greed and consumerism gone wild, darker aspects of Christmas fever, as long as we ignore that stuff, there is a lot about this time of year that's beautiful and worth celebrating. That's probably why the number one rule is treat every day like Christmas. It's how the world ought to be. But in a world that has grown cynical, where belief and Christmas spirit are in short supply, almost gone, what's it going to take to help people believe again? Well, the best way to spread Christmas cheer is singing loud for all to hear. We got to sing along, not just listen, not just learn the words, not just move our lips. So Buddy the Elf goes to New York, finds his biological father, Walter Hobbs, and he tragically finds out that Walter is on the naughty list because he's a terrible person. He's a horrible father. He's an absent husband. He's cynical and jaded, has no interest whatsoever in his long-lost son who psychotically thinks he was raised by elves at the North Pole. But Buddy's goodness, it gets through to him. Because the world looks like a different place through Buddy's eyes. And then when people see the world the way he sees it, They see wonder and magic, things they didn't see before. And it changes them. 
People see something in Buddy that they don't see in other people. Childlike faith, hope, mad etch set skills. The ability to throw snowballs like a machine gun with the accuracy of a well-trained sniper. Even his bio dad, Walter Hobbs, naughty list and proud of it, complete unbeliever. Even he slowly changes in the course of the movie. In the final scene, when Buddy's new girlfriend, Jovi, she stands up and she starts leading the crowd to sing Santa Claus is Coming to Town. She's trying to help spread Christmas cheer so the sleigh can fly and save Christmas. And everyone starts singing along. Children and news reporters and bikers in bars. Everyone singing except for Walter Hobbs. He just stands there like moving his lips. And his younger son calls him out on it. He says, Dad, why aren't you singing? You're just moving your lips. So Walter starts to sing for real. And it's at that moment that Santa and the sleigh and the reindeer come whooshing over his head. And not a moment before, he actually starts really singing. See, listening to people sing, that may or may not cheer you up, kind of depending on how well they sing and what song they're singing. But if you start singing yourself out loud, I don't care who you are or what song you're singing, it's going to improve your disposition. You could sing gloom, despair, and agony on me, and it would probably still do you some good. Imagine how much better it would be if you sang the kind of song that God tells you to sing. In Psalm 40, it says this. It says, I waited patiently for the Lord to help me. And he turned to me, and he heard my cry. He lifted me out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and the mire. And he set my feet on solid ground, and he steadied me as I walked along. He has given me a new song to sing, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see what he's done and be amazed, and they will put their trust in the Lord. He has given me a new song to sing. And it's not just a suggestion, guys. Psalm 96, 1 says, sing to the Lord a new song. That's an order. Psalm 33, 3, that's like our new church life verse. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully with a loud noise. That sounds about right, doesn't it? It's also a command. (laughs) Psalm 98.1, it's another one. Sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done wonderful things. Psalm 148.1, Isaiah 42.10, Psalm 144.9. Even in Revelation where we have this glimpse of worship that's going on in heaven. In Revelation chapter 5, it says, And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you, for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. And in chapter 14, it says, And they sang a new song before the throne, And before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn the song except the ones who had been purchased from the earth. Did you know that you've been purchased by the cross of Jesus? You knew that? Do you believe that? Because if you do, guys, then you can learn the song. And once you learn it, you need to actually sing it. Singing 
It's kind of a big deal to God. When we sing his word, when we sing his promises, it does something to us. It puts that word and those promises in our heart, in our mind. It builds our faith. And it also allows us to praise him with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all our strength. When we sing together, man, that unifies us in prayer and worship in a way that really nothing else does. When we all sing together out loud in one place so the whole world can hear us proclaim the things we believe, the promises of the kingdom of God, the gospel. That's the best way to spread the joy of the Lord. That's the best way to spread Christmas cheer. It's our participation in the song that builds our faith. And at the same time, spreads our faith to other people. So we got to sing along. Not just listen. Not just move our lips. It becomes a new song when we make it new and alive in us. When it's alive in us, when we express that life by singing out loud, that's how the gospel is shared with other people. We don't argue people into faith. We don't teach them into faith by showing them how they're wrong and we're right. Seeing isn't believing. We sing them into faith. Believing is seeing. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth sings. I will sing unto the Lord a new song. Many will see and hear. The best way to spread Christmas cheer is singing loud for all to hear. Do you feel like you're on the naughty list? Or you ought to be. Sing to Jesus. There's room on the nice list for everyone. Even you. Do you feel stressed? Overwhelmed? Sing to Jesus. Do you feel hopeless and tired? Sad? Sing to Jesus. Learn the song. And then sing it out loud for everyone to hear. What was it that the angels sang when Jesus was born? Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth. Peace to those on whom his favor rests. His favor rests on you. You hear me? His favor rests on you. Believe it. And sing along. For more information, go to newchurchtexas.com or email frank at frankheart.com. If these online resources have been meaningful to you, please consider going to newchurchtx.com slash give and show your support by helping make this ministry possible. Thank you.